Making any movie is such a difficult endeavor, it's a miracle that any of them get made. There are movies like the recent Fast and Furious entries where there were reports of bad blood between Vin Diesel and The Rock. Not nice, but manageable. Then there are movies like Titanic where the difficulty gets turned up to 10. The movie starts getting delayed, people start getting injured, and the budget more than doubles. This video is not about those kinds of movies. This video is about the productions that make cast and crew wish that they were as easy as Titanic. This is about the productions where things get turned up to 11 and where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. It's about the movies where people start dropping like flies, where years turn into decades, where literal documentaries are made about their difficulty, where even God seems to hate everyone involved. Not mildly dislike, hate, to the point of visiting natural disasters upon them. Literally every production on this list had to deal with at least one act of God. This video is about the movies that, on the surface, don't look like they should have been terribly difficult, but that, by the end, you'll be left wondering how anyone kept their sanity. And some of these men almost did lose it. Even though Werner Herzog's 1972 epic, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, was a painful production, what with the flooding and the traversing mountains while carrying all your gear and having to deal with Klaus Kinski, it's obvious that 1982's Fitzcarraldo was the cursed production, what with the literal tribal warfare hauling a 320-ton steamship over a hill and, of course, having to deal with Klaus Kinski. Herzog really knew how to pick him. Fitzcarraldo was a deadly, dangerous, and wild shoot, and it's widely considered to be one of the most difficult shoots ever. It's one of those everything that could go wrong, did go wrong situations, and a good chunk of it was self-inflicted. And most unfortunately, people actually died or suffered lifelong injuries while working on it. Born of the mad ambition of a singular individual, Herzog was inspired by one detail from the life of a 19th century Peruvian rubber baron, Carlos Fermin Fitzcarl Lopez. In Herzog's words, that detail was, quote, that he crossed an isthmus from one river system into another with a boat. They disassembled the boat and put it together again on the other river, end quote. But Fitzcarl's steamship weighed just 30 tons. What Herzog wanted was something more harrowing. He wanted the cast to haul a 320-ton steamship over a hill. He said, quote, this is a film that challenges the most basic laws of nature. Boats are not meant to fly over mountains. Fitzcarraldo's story is the victory of the weightlessness of dreams over the heaviness of reality, end quote. To achieve that victory means that no special effects were used, nor was a scale model of the boat used, though scale models were used for other scenes. It was to be done by the indigenous people, the Matagwinga, and by their own hands. A winching system was set up and, with the assistance of an unreliable bulldozer, hundreds of extras pulled the 640,000-pound monster up a muddy hill. When it reached the top, they had to stop. The water on the other side had receded thanks to a drought, and they needed to wait for the rainy season. God was not on Herzog's side, and it's a miracle that no one died during this scene. Not everyone was so lucky, though. The reason the film is considered so difficult begins with the location. The jungle is never a hospitable place to shoot. It's hot and humid, rife with disease, difficult to navigate, cut off from civilization, and teeming with animals that can kill you. One poor soul discovered this the hard way when they were bitten by a venomous snake. Nick Thorpe, writing for the Sunday Herald, wrote, quote, A Peruvian logger bitten by a deadly snake made the dramatic decision to cut off his own foot with a chainsaw to prevent the spread of the venom, end quote. Another poor soul, meanwhile, drowned after operating a canoe. And, as this is a remote location, they needed to rely on planes to get equipment and supplies in and out. There would end up being two small plane crashes, which resulted in five critical injuries and one person being paralyzed. But even more wild is the inner trouble war that broke out. Nick Thorpe again wrote, quote, In one of the region's driest summers on record, scavenging Amawaka tribes people launched a scavenging hit-and-run raid on the film camp. One man was lucky to survive an arrow through his throat while his wife was hit in the stomach, necessitating eight hours of emergency surgery on a kitchen table, end quote. Herzog, by his own admission, participated in the surgery, saying, quote, I assisted by illuminating her abdominal cavity with a torchlight and with my other hand sprayed with repellent the clouds of mosquitoes that swarmed around the blood, end quote. Some of the extras, which consisted of the Machiguenga, considered launching a revenge raid, but Herzog supposedly convinced them otherwise. 
This incident is also when the crew used up all of their anesthesia, so that when cinematographer Thomas Mouch split open his hand, he had to get 10 stitches without any painkiller whatsoever. He would call those 10 stitches, quote, the worst pain I have ever experienced, end quote. At least medical treatment saved his life, though. Part and parcel of the jungle is disease, and some of the extras would not make it. And then there was Klaus Kinski. Kinski, who played Brian Sweeney Fitzgerald, was a violent man, and Fitzcarraldo might have been the peak of that violence. He and Herzog had a pyrrhic relationship that began before they got into the movie business, after Kinski destroyed the apartment he and Herzog shared when they were younger. In Herzog's words, quote, we had a great love, a great bond, but both of us planned to murder each other, end quote. Kinski got into fights with everyone, and his erratic behavior terrified the cast and crew, especially the Machagwenga extras. According to Herzog, the chief of the tribe would even offer to assassinate Kinski on Herzog's behalf thanks to his abusive behavior. Herzog declined at the time, saying that Kinski was necessary to complete the film, but one does get the impression that he regretted his choice. That's because Herzog later admitted that he planned to murder Kinski one night by setting fire to his place while Kinski was still inside. He got as far as trying to set his place on fire before Kinski's dog attacked and stopped him. In Burden of Dreams, the legendary documentary about the painful shoot, Herzog said that, quote, it's the land that God, if he exists, has created in anger, end quote. God, it seems, also vented his anger at Herzog's production. The director would later declare, quote, I shouldn't make movies anymore. I should go to a lunatic asylum, end quote. The director of a film is the commander of a small fighting force. They go where he commands them. Herzog commanded them to move more than 600,000 pounds of steel, and they did. He commanded them to come to the jungle, and they did. In order to fulfill Werner Herzog's dreams, some people lost their lives, limbs, and livelihoods. Is the movie a testament to their sacrifice, to Herzog's mad ambition, or both? Whatever the case, it's certainly true that everyone that worked on this movie also left a bit of themselves behind. You know things are bad when you have a documentary that's all about how terrible your production was. Fitzcarraldo has Burden of Dreams, Apocalypse Now has Hearts of Darkness, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote has Lost in La Mancha, Alejandro Jodorowsky's Unmade Dune movie has Jodorowsky's Dune, and Tim Burton's Unmade Superman Lives movie has The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened? Well, The Island of Dr. Moreau has Lost Soul, the doomed journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. The 1996 flop is best remembered now for what a disaster it was at literally every stage of production. Acts of God delay the production, the actors delay the production, a change in directors delay the production, an unfinished script delay the production, men were reduced to tears, reputations were reduced to shreds, sabotage was feared, at least one man's dreams were totally crushed while another learned why you should never meet your heroes. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It's not for nothing that one of the screenwriters would say that quote, it was an island of crazy people, an awful experience, end quote. The movie was the passion project of Richard Stanley, who had developed it over four years before it was greenlit by New Line Cinema, who would take a massive loss on it. Things were sour from the get-go, as New Line did not want Stanley on the film. They were able to get Marlon Brando for a hefty fee and went around Stanley's back to offer the director's job to Roman Polanski. Now, there are two conflicting stories about why Stanley was kept on. The first is that Brando liked him and supported him, which tied New Line's hands. The other story is voodoo. Stanley said that he employed the help of Dr. Edward James Featherstone, a warlock that was known as Skip. In Stanley's words, quote, Skip convened his coven, cut his arm, drew a sigil, and did some sort of routine to make it all all right, end quote, and that, quote, there's a very strong possibility that it may have been voodoo or some kind of magical interference on Skip's behalf, end quote, that forced Polanski off the project. Whatever the case, this is where the good news ends. It's all downhill from here. First, Stanley was able to get Bruce Willis to join the cast as the lead, Edward Prendick, but Willis would have to leave before filming even began thanks to an impending divorce from his wife at the time, Demi Moore. He would be replaced with Val Kilmer, who also got served with divorce papers from his own wife. Kilmer immediately made things difficult, demanding that his shooting days be reduced by nearly half. To comply, Stanley switched Kilmer from Prendick to the supporting character Montgomery, who had less screen time. Rob Morrow was instead hired to play Prendick, but that would not last. Then, Cheyenne Brando, Marlon Brando's daughter, committed suicide. The reclusive actor became even more reclusive and retreated to his private island. He would not be on set when the movie started filming, meaning that Richard Stanley lost his only backer. It could not come at a worse time for Stanley. He was already on thin ice. After Willis left and Kimmel was shifted around, he could not afford to lose Brando as well. 
Kilmer was also being, for lack of a better word, a total asshole. At this point, Kilmer already had a reputation for being an asshole. For the island of Dr. Moreau, he decided to turn it up to 11 and going as far as putting out a cigarette on a cameraman. Honestly, it's kind of understandable why his wife left him. He was dismissive and insulting of the script, undermined Stanley where he could, was not delivering his lines, and, spitefully, arrived two days late to the filming location near Cairns in Australia. At this already precarious time, the weather also decided to spite Richard Stanley. The set was pummeled by a hurricane which forced them to stop filming altogether. The movie, which would be notable for going over budget, barely began and the costs and delays were already piling up. It all got to be too much for Rob Morrow, who broke down in tears and begged New Line founder Bob Shea to be let go. Shea agreed. And this was after just two days of filming. That's all it took to break him. On the third day, Richard Stanley was fired. The man who spent half a decade fighting for this passion project, going so far as to employ the services of a warlock, was let go. New Line offered Stanley his full directing fee if he went quietly. Well, they miscalculated. The man suffered a mental break, started destroying documents, then up and vanished. New Line would increase security, fearful of sabotage. Even after Stanley was replaced by director John Frankenheimer, the production never recovered its footing. Frankenheimer himself did not really care about the project. He cared about working with Brando and getting a good deal for himself, which he did. He shut down production for close to two weeks in order to replace Rob Marr with David Thewlis, bring on Ron Hutchinson to rewrite the script, and get Marlon Brando to come down and recalibrate. Frankenheimer soon learned while Marlon Brando also had a difficult reputation. He refused to learn his lines, spent hours in his trailer when he was supposed to be filming, similar to what he did on Apocalypse Now, showed up wearing white powder for some reason, wore a bucket hat, and did a bunch of other odd things. He also took a liking to Nelson De La Rosa, who he demanded a larger role for. Frankenheimer acquiesced. Ron Hutchinson, who idolized Brando, learned why you should never meet your heroes, saying that Brando, quote, was way beyond board with the making of movies. Overweight, unprepared, mocking, dismissive, on the razor's edge where Caprice becomes malice, the case for the prosecution is therefore easily made. He was indeed here to sabotage this movie, end quote. Frankenheimer, whatever he thought of Brando, was blunt in his assessment of Val Kilmer, saying, quote, I don't like Val Kilmer. I don't like his work ethic, and I don't want to be associated with him ever again, end quote. Of course, Frankenheimer wasn't exactly a peach to work with. He would quickly get on bad terms with many of the cast and crew. In a 1998 Guardian article, he didn't have much kind words for the movie, saying, quote, It was that bad, a horrendous experience in which I was working with a group of actors who didn't get along. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong, end quote. All of this was compounded by the fact that the script was being rewritten daily. People barely knew what they were supposed to be doing. In Thulis's words, quote, We all had different ideas of where it should go. I even ended up improvising some of the main scenes with Marlon, end quote. All the while, Richard Stanley never left Australia. After suffering his breakdown, he retreated to a remote area in Cairns where he encountered some of the film staff. They helped Stanley sneak back on a set as an extra and disguised him in full costume as one of the monsters. The former director literally became an extra and watched another man direct his passion project. When the movie finally wrapped after a painful shoot, Stanley said, quote, I took the dog mask off and showed who I was. Kilmer came up and hugged and kissed me and said how sorry he was, end quote. While it was a nice gesture, it certainly did not change the outcome. The movie was destroyed critically and commercially in no small part, thanks to obstinance all around. As Ron Hutchinson said, quote, everybody behaved monstrously to each other, end quote. The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, directed by Terry Gilliam, was a hard-fought battle each step of the miserable way. And Gilliam would call it, quote, one of those dream nightmares that never leave you until you finish the thing, end quote. The movie was absolutely cursed from start to finish, and irrespective of its critical or commercial performance, it's a testament to Terry Gilliam's focus, commitment, and sheer will. Seeing a movie to completion requires a dogged pursuit, and sticking with it for decades, like Phil Tippett did with Mad God, or Francis Ford Coppola did with Megalopolis, is admirable as a feat if nothing else. Gilliam, who's best known for his work on movies like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Brazil, Time Bandits, the Fisher King and Twelve Monkeys first had the idea for The Man Who Killed Don Quixote in the late 80s after he had read the novel by Miguel de Cervantes. He had no idea that between then and the release, decades would pass and he would cycle through several actors, scripts, false starts, and lawsuits to get the movie made. His first attempt fell by the wayside pretty quickly. He felt that the budget was too low and that he could not get the right actor. He left the movie to work on another project, which also fell through. For a moment, he got replaced by another director, but that didn't work out either, and the production was halted entirely. 
Driven by regret, Gilliam decided to give it another try after fear and loathing in Las Vegas saying, quote, that really hurts that I let a project I'm convinced I'm the best director on the planet to do slip by, end quote. And for a moment, things seemed like they were going well. Johnny Depp was cast as Tommy Grummet, a man who gets thrown back in time. And Gene Rochefort was cast as Don Quixote. Gilliam's budget was $32 million and he started shooting in September of 2000. Then everything went wrong. This is how a Vox article described it, quote, On the first day of shooting, a constant roar of jets at a nearby NATO airbase caused sound problems and delayed production. The next day, a sudden violent storm flooded the set, washed equipment into a gully, and reshaped the landscape entirely. The set eventually dried up, but then Gene Rochefort, who was to play Quixote, was hospitalized with a back injury, end quote. Keep in mind that all of this happened in less than a week. Rochefort dropped out, and after two months, the production was cancelled. At this point, Gilliam must have figured that this was going to be a quixotic endeavor. The flood damage also was not covered by insurance, which was a major issue. The investors filed an insurance claim, which resulted in a $15 million payout. After a documentary about the project, Lost in La Mancha, was released, people assumed that the production was cursed. It's not hard to see why. Even cinematographer Nicola Pecorini would say, quote, Never in 22 years of being in this business have I seen such a sum of bad luck, end quote. The project kept rebooting and failing, with actors like Ewan McGregor, Robert Duvall, and John Hurt coming and going. The same Vox article captured the vagaries of the financing as well. Quote, Along with the actors, various funding sources came and went, with news of financial collapse and revival becoming a staple of movie industry coverage. Things looked good in 2008, then fell apart. The same thing happened in 2010 and 2013 and 2014. The movie's production was once again suspended in September 2015 when Hurt, who was set to play Quixote, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, end quote. Absolutely nothing was going right with this movie. A lesser man would have quit by now, but Terry Gilliam was not such a man, saying, quote, it is not dead. I will be dead before the film is, end quote. Like Sisyphus, he kept pushing the rock back up only to have it come back down time and time again. In 2016, an unscrupulous producer, Paolo Branco, came in, lied about getting the funds necessary, tried to cut salaries, and steal the project from Gilliam, and everything got delayed again. 2017 was the moment of truth, though. Gilliam got the money, though less than he wanted, secured his stars, who decided to take pay cuts, and began filming what, shockingly, went off without a hitch this time. Production lasted from March to June of 2017. This required Gilliam to sidestep Branco, who would eventually sue and become a thorn in Gilliam's side for years. Branco even tried to stop the movie from being shown at Cannes, but was unsuccessful in his endeavor. Peter Bradshaw, writing for The Guardian, said that the movie was, quote, the act of a furious Old Testament god with a serious grudge against Terry Gilliam, end quote. He was right about the grudge, but writing in 2002, he was wrong about his conclusion. More than a decade and a half later, Terry Gilliam won the battle. The curse was broken, though the mental cost must have been huge. Roar is a movie that uses real-life animals, lions, leopards, tigers, jaguars, cougars, and others. Not just a few, more than a hundred, most of them untrained. You can already tell where this is going. That's exactly where this is going. Numbers vary, but somewhere between 70 and 100 people, including cast, crew, and the director, Noel Marshall, were mauled by the big cats on set. Principal photography took five years, though the overall movie took around a decade thanks to Marshall and his wife at the time, Tippi Hedren, literally putting every cent that they had into it. Noel Marshall himself suffered around a dozen bites. One mauling to his face and chest left him with blood poisoning, while another left him with gangrene. It would take years to recover. And while he was indisposed, the weather decided to add insult to injury because why the hell not? Randolph Sellers, who worked on the movie and who has a wonderful write-up about the troubled production on stage 32, described it as such, quote, While Noel was in the hospital, monsoon rains came and flooded the ranch. Most of the African set was flooded and ruined. Mudslides wiped out a series of fences, allowing lines to escape. Concerned for public safety, nervous sheriff deputies shot and killed one of the star male lions. Even worse, a mysterious feline disease broke out and decimated their cat population. Later, wildfires erupted and burned portions of the ranch. It took over a year for the set to be rebuilt and the exterior environments to grow back enough to resume filming, end quote. Also, those wildfires started burning just after the flooding issues were resolved. Some deity really hated roar. Marshall's wife, Tippi Hedren, who once almost lost an eye after getting attacked by real birds on Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, fared no better. This time, she was bitten in the head by a lion and had her ankle fractured and shoulder broken by an elephant bucking her off. She was also scratched and bitten by a leopard and cougar, respectively. 
Her daughter, Melanie Griffith, needed facial reconstructive surgery after getting mauled by a lioness. She needed 50 stitches and, like her mother years before, almost lost an eye. Cinematographer John DeBont was scalped by a lion. He needed 220 stitches and later said that Roar, quote, is the only picture I almost lost my head over, end quote. Assistant director Doran Cowper suffered injuries to the throat, jaw, and ear, scalp, chest, and thigh. He needed to undergo a lengthy four and a half hour surgery to save his life. An untold and probably ungodly number of stitches were needed. And now that I think about it, this might have been the worst injury. Marshall's sons, John and Jerry, also got hurt. John was bitten in the head by a line and he needed more than 50 stitches. Jerry, meanwhile, got off easy, only suffering a foot bite while wearing shoes. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. So many more people were attacked. So how was the cast and crew rewarded? Well, the movie could not find American distribution, so they lost pretty much everything that they put into the movie. It would not be released in the US until 2015. Still, it's difficult not to admire what they did for their art, even though it was somewhat ill-advised. When people think of a difficult, cursed, or painful movie production, they'll probably think of Apocalypse Now. It's not for nothing that the movie almost killed Francis Ford Coppola on four separate occasions. Three times he threatened to shoot himself, and the fourth he had an epileptic seizure. Thinking that this was it, the last things he said before being carted off for treatment wasn't expressing a love for his family or thankfulness to his crew. It was for his friend and business partner, George Lucas, to finish Apocalypse Now on his behalf. Apocalypse Now was hell to make and there's a laundry list of problems. Martin Sheen had an actual heart attack and had to crawl a quarter of a mile to get help. They were filming in the jungle, so of course people got disease, hookworms, and dysentery. A typhoon destroyed their sets two months in, shut down production, and put them over budget by millions and behind schedule by weeks. Some local hires stole money. A member of the construction crew died while building a set. There was an actual war going on in the Philippines at the time, and some of the helicopters Coppola used would fly away during filming to participate. Brando was his difficult self, showing up overweight and unprepared, and on and on and on. And considering he had sunk millions of his own money into the production, it's no wonder that Coppola was at his wit's end. The fact that he got the movie over the finish line is, frankly, a miracle. All of these movies share some commonalities. They were helmed by very ambitious men who not only wanted to see their dreams come alive, but damn near forced them into being, often at the cost of their cast and crew. Except for The Island of Dr. Moreau, the director that began the project saw it to completion. And even in that one odd case, Stanley literally snuck back on set until the movie was complete. That takes passion, a certain resolve that most would find difficult to muster. A lot of people, when they encounter difficulty, demur. They flinch and back off, sometimes scrapping the project entirely. And that's often a wise decision. But some people are just built different. The movie is seen as an obstacle to be conquered, and that's exactly what all these directors did. The critical and commercial performance of these movies is secondary. The sheer ambition on display is, as far as I'm concerned, the main attraction.